to shine on me and that my soul knows very well. You lift me up, I'm cleansed and free and that my soul knows very well. You make your face to shine on me and that my soul knows very well. You lift me up, I'm cleansed and free, and then my soul knows very well. When mountains fall, I'll stand by the power of your hand, and in your heart of hearts I'll dwell. And then my soul knows very well. When mountains fall, I'll stand. Each day I'll find, and then my soul knows very well. Forgiveness, hope, I know is mine, then my soul knows very well. When mountains fall, I'll stand by the power of your hand, in your heart of hearts I'll dwell, and then my soul So we are considering the theme of the journey of a disciple in these post-Easter uh, weeks, and particularly <clears throat> looking at these scriptures through the eyes of Peter. So Peter, one of the twelve apostles, and we're going to be looking at stories of Peter or referencing Peter throughout a variety of Gospels, which we've already started. And this text comes from us, or to us, from the Gospel of Mark. And we know that Mark was the first Gospel and was uh, written by Mark, and Peter was his tutor, if you like. So Peter is the one who is guiding Mark in his writing. So it makes sense that there would be a variety of references uh, and stories that Peter knew pretty well that would be in this gospel, seeing that he was the one who was leading. And so if you look at this chapter carefully, <coughs> uh, there are a number of time references. And these time references cover an entire day. So it begins with the Sabbath, Saturday, and it moves through a variety of episodes. And then it follows through to the following morning uh, when Jesus is in the wilderness praying, and then they move on. So there are five episodes covering one day, hence the title, A Day in the Life of Jesus. So I would say that this day actually was fairly typical of what Christ would be about. Um, so we'll just keep that in mind as we, as we look at these scriptures. So if you have your Bible, you might want to check it out. Mark 1, 21 through 39. So I'll just hit some of the highlights. Uh, there we go. Do I have this on? Oh, I do. Sorry, Seppi. I do now. There we go. Thank you. I won't reread all the scriptures, but just to set up these five episodes. So they went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught... And they were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So Capernaum was the base for Jesus in his ministry uh, for the three years of ministry. 
Capernaum right on the Sea of Galilee. And that is where a variety of the disciples were from, that town. So Jesus chooses his closest four disciples who were fishermen in the town of Capernaum, working those waters, working those, that sea. And still there is a lot of fishing in the Sea of Galilee. It still is a, a place you see the boats go out, uh, still an active place for fishing. So we know that Jesus um, went to the synagogue in the beginning stages of his ministry. He went to the synagogues first to, to speak, to speak to his own people and to guide them in the good news that he came to declare, the good news. So we're going to hear a lot about you know, miracles and healing and casting out demons and so on, but the main ministry of Jesus is preaching. So his ministry is divided into three units. It's preaching, it's teaching, and it's healing. But he does not come as a miracle worker. That's not his point. He comes to proclaim the good news. So preaching is what he is about. And the miracles are just a way to kind of uh, get people's attention, if you like. So we note how it starts here. Then Jesus goes to the synagogue and he teaches, Mark says, with authority which is differentiated from the scribes who did not teach that way. They taught more pedantically, more like in a classroom, just saying the words and getting through. Jesus is speaking with exousia, energy, power. There's a dynamic to Christ's teaching, and it startles them. Like No one else preaches this way. None of the Pharisees, none of the scribes speak that way. When Jesus speaks, he commands attention. So there are suggestions, you know, in, the, in the, the epistles that, you know, Jesus was, from what we can see, not particularly an attractive person. I mean, physically, he was not beautiful to look at. He was, St. Paul says the same for himself. He was just the guy. But when he spoke, wow. People were mindful of who is this person. It just kind of blows them away. So we keep that in mind, because why would, why would fishermen change their entire lives, give up their careers to follow this guy? There had to be something about Jesus and his words. Again, not a marvel to look at. He's not some outstanding, huge you know, football star. He's just a person from Galilee. But they give up everything to follow him. And, you know, that's, that's the kind of word he has. And so why do we read the word today? It, it continues to have this kind of energy. The word does have that. If you will read the word, find, find a, a translation that works for you and be in it, and it will speak, and it will speak with power. Definitely. It's one of the reasons why here in this church we... I, anyway, put a big emphasis on the Scriptures and speak the Scriptures. Because really, who, who cares what I say? What does the Scripture say? And that's what we're about. How does that speak to you? So as he's speaking, Jesus is interrupted by a man, and he has a demon. That's the language that is used in the day. There's something about him, and he yells out in the middle. It'd be like one of you standing up right now and yelling out, Everybody then looks at this person. person says, I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. Have you come to destroy us? So the, the man is speaking. Demon-possessed. That's how Mark describes him. And Jesus, note, it's, it's amazing, really. I don't know if you've ever been to a lot of uh, healing uh, ministries. I grew up in the Pentecostal church, and I went to a whole bunch. And it can be a very good ministry. But a lot of times, there's a lot of stuff going on. A lot of stuff, man. When Jesus, when Jesus prays, what does he do? He just says, be silent, come out. That's the end of it. <laughs> there's no big production. He's not wrestling with the guy. He just says, be silent, come out. Demon comes out. It's not a show. Jesus is not here to be a miracle worker, but he deals with this person. The demon comes out. 
Jesus carries on. So Jesus in the synagogue, his, his, his disciples are with him. So the whole point here is to kind of think about going through Jesus in a day, a day with Jesus. So it's a day with Jesus in the synagogue. Well, you're beginning your day, a day in church. Synagogue was the church. So how do we hear God's voice even today? What are demons today? Well, there are personal demons. I believe in that for sure. There are people who are demon-possessed. But also, there are demons at work in our world. They are not just personal demons. And I would say the major demons that we're fighting are much bigger than that. And so someone speaks this way. What are the modern equivalents at individual family, society, national, and international level that Jesus is speaking about and embodying in his actions with authority, the kingdom of God which is drawing near? And specifically, it raises issue of justice in our society, of peace in our world, of poverty, racism, sexism, starvation. All of these issues. This writer, very good Australian commentator, says what are the issues that we're dealing with? What are the demons in our world? I mean, what causes all the crap in our world? What causes all the, the warfare in our world? I mean, what are the powers? Paul says we wrestle against powers, authorities and powers. So there are powers in our world. There is a spiritual realm. And in our society, you know, we, we, our society lives as if there is no spiritual realm, really. It's just physical. Just here. Cause and effect, boom. Nothing more. But the Bible suggests and argues that there is more, and it makes sense. Totally it makes sense, does it not? We know, you know, or you wouldn't be here that there's a spiritual realm. When we worship God, we know that there's a spiritual realm. We, it's not make-believe. We are praising our God. When you go through your day, you are with your God, Jesus, walking with you. So that is a dynamic that is true and real, and we want to be aware of that. Jesus, it, it, it comes forth in the, in the Gospels all the time. Pray for the peace of Israel, the psalm says. Ren sends a hundred drones or whatever towards Israel, right? I mean, it's like... It's not just people making decisions. There's more than that going on. And unfortunately, it's, there's more of that going on in our own lives than we ever want to recognize. So we need to be listening to God's voice. Issues of justice, peace, poverty, racism, sexism, starvation. You could go on and on, a whole bunch more. Issues that we deal with, that the powers are also at work. Certainly in Jesus' day, the first century, the Greco-Roman powers, people lived with a much greater consciousness of this than we do today. They understood there were lots of gods, and they were active. They believed that. Jesus didn't have to convince them of that. So with Jesus in the synagogue... As soon as they left the synagogue, they entered the house of Simon and Andrew with James and John. So it's like us going after church. Where do we go? Well, we go home for lunch. We go to Swiss Chalet. Did anybody still go to Swiss Chalet? Does anybody do that? Man, you know what? I, we, Beth and I were at uh, Tyndale for so many years. There was a Swiss Chalet just down the street on Bayview, like a block away. So we would often go there for dinner before we taught our classes. And after a while, I'm sorry, I could not handle another Swiss Chalet. I had gone so many times, I did not want to eat another piece of Swiss chalet chicken. That was it. Forget it. And the gravy or whatever they have, or the sauce. Like, I couldn't handle it, man, and I know some people love it, right? It's probably great, but I, I hope in all of our building and development we don't put a Swiss chalet in in Western. <laughs> I'm praying that we won't do that. Whatever we do, we don't do that. <laughs> so they leave the synagogue, and they go to... Simon's house. Would Simon not remember this event? Sure he would remember it. Now Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever. In fact, this gospel is the only one who tells this story. Simon's mother-in-law was in bed with a fever, and they told him about her at once. 
And he came and took her by the hand and lifted her up, and then the fever left her and she began to serve them. So this is a domestic miracle. There's a scene in the synagogue. They now walk down the street. They come to Simon and Andrew's house. The two families, the two brothers are living together. It looks like the two families are together. Clearly, Simon's mother-in-law is there. So there's an, an extended family situation going on here. In fact, they found the home of St. Peter that they think indeed was that. There's lots of archaeological work in, Caper in Capernaum. And it's a series of huts with a wall around it. They think that may well be it. So that sort of situation, that's where they go. The four disciples go. They tell Jesus about the mother-in-law, and Jesus goes and heals her. Note that Jesus goes and touches her. He doesn't just speak a word. He touches, embraces her, raises her up. And what's interesting here is that the woman is healed, and then she gets up and serves them. And, and now... Uh, you know, I don't want us to pause and miss this because it is not some sort of sexist statement. That's not the point. Oh, yeah, the mother-in-law gets up and serves the guys their lunch, right? That's not the point. The point here is diakoneo is to serve. She gets up, and her role as a model disciple is to serve. Diakoneo. Jesus came not to be served, but to serve, Mark 10, 45. It's the same word. So I'm not knocking, you know, preparing a meal for your loved ones. That's terrific. Beth does it wonderfully for me all the time, right? And I don't, unfortunately, do that. What do I do? I take out the garbage. Come on. Every Thursday night, I'm there, man. I'm on that. Like a, like a whippersnap, I'm there. <laughs> she serves. And we're invited to serve, right? Darlene mentioned that in terms of, in terms of giving. It's, it's, it's a one way to serve. People are out working with the kids right now. That, that's, that's, that's service, right? For church to run, any kind of faith community to run, we need people who will serve. Diakoneo. Peter's mother-in-law does this. She understands that Jesus has healed her. She is grateful. She serves him a meal. Quite natural. It's interesting. I came across a sermon by Jerome. And Jerome was one of the early church fathers, as they called them. And he preached a sermon in Bethlehem in 400 A.D. So that goes way, way back, right? 400 A.D., in the church in Bethlehem, which would still be standing. And Jerome wrote this. Oh, that he would come to our house and enter and heal the fever of our sins by his command. For each and every one of us suffers from fever. When I grow angry, he says, I am feverish. So many vices, so many fevers. When I read that, I thought, well, you know, that's, that's pretty interesting. So the issue is, what are our fevers? We can have physical fevers, for sure, but we can also have fevers that need to be removed. So we ask the question, what are the demons in our world? We can now ask, what are the fevers in our world? What are the fevers in your life? Can be anger. Could be jealousy. Could be lust, right? There's lots of fevers. What are the fevers? Anxiety can be a big fever. Doubt. What other fevers? Anybody got any suggestions? Fear, yeah. Anger, fear. Anyone else? Sorry? Addictions. Addictions, yes. Fevers, right? Sin? Mm -hmm. Anxiety? You know, all of these fevers we wrestle with. And so Jesus helps us 
in dealing with these fevers, right? He does, he does. But we need to go to him. So we need to wrestle, hear the scriptures, be encouraged. We need to go and praise. We need to be with other believers. We need to engage what we call the spiritual disciplines so that we are in the day with Jesus in all of your arrangements. So when you become anxious, then Jesus is there to help you with your anxiety. When you become fearful, because the devil will raise these up, so then who's going to help us calm them down? So I think in this picture, so it begins in the synagogue, it then moves to the house. And Jesus touches this woman and removes her fever. How does Jesus remove our fevers? When you have one, you know about it, right? When you're in the midst of it, you know about it. That's what we need help from. That evening at sunset, they brought to him all who were sick or possessed with demons. And the whole city was gathered around the door. This is the third episode. Begins in the synagogue, moves to Peter's house. And then at sunset, why is that important? Because now the Sabbath is over. And when the Sabbath is over, the sun goes down. It's now about 6 o'clock at night on the Saturday. All the town gathers around Peter's house, bringing the sick, because they've heard that Jesus was there, they heard that the mother-in-law was healed, Now they, and they've heard the fame of Jesus. So they bring their sick for Jesus to heal. No wonder that Peter remembers this event. If your whole street gathered around your house, you would remember that. Peter remembers that. Share, says, Mark, write this down. This is important. Many were healed. The word for heal there is therapeuo, which we get therapy from. Cured, therapy. They received therapy, divine therapy. Jesus the healer, working in their lives, healing them. Many, many, the text tells us. So Jesus continues to be that healer for us. And Jesus heals in all kinds of ways. God heals in all kinds of ways, right? Not through doctors, through nurses, through medical care. We are, we are blessed. I mean, I, I read just this week that in the top ten cities in the world, three of them are in Canada. In terms of quality of living, in Toronto is one of them. It was about number seven. You might think that's hard to believe, right? But... That shows that Toronto is actually a pretty good place to live. And they talk about education, they talk about uh, transportation, and they talk about medical care. So in spite of all of our waiting in the hospitals, it's still way better than many, many places in our world. So all those ways, we get touched and healed. I've had a lot of dental work done over the years in Bolivia, probably mentioned it. My dentist was a Christian, and he had a big picture on his wall, which I stared at when he was drilling and doing my root canals. I looked at this big picture, and it was a picture of Jesus. And it was Jesus standing behind the dentist. The idea was that Jesus is helping this guy. And I was saying oftentimes, Lord, help him. Help him, help him, help him. He's going deeper and deeper on some group crazy root canal. Yikes, I hate those things. But Jesus helped. Healing on the street, as I've been saying. Here we have a picture of, this is Rembrandt's 100 Gilder print, it's known as. And Rembrandt paints this picture, and it shows Jesus there in the middle. You can see him with the halo around him. But all the people all the people around. So the idea, Rembrandt is preaching, and, or preaching in his own way, painting, is where are you in that scene? Find yourself in the scene. I don't know how well you can see that from where you are. But people are close, people are distant, people are being touched, people are looking, observing, what, whatever that might be. Where are you? Where am I? How do we observe Jesus? Jesus. 
What's your response? Jesus comes to heal. Jesus comes to make us well. Isaiah says that we are healed by the stripes of Christ or the stripes of the Messiah. We are healed by the stripes. Beth grew up in the Christian Missionary Alliance, and that idea is formative in the Alliance. We are healed by the stripes of the Messiah. And so in the Christian Missionary Alliance churches, healing, in spite of being actually a fairly conservative church right across the board, they embrace healing. Because we are healed by the stripes. You know, that's a good thing. We could learn from our brothers and sisters in that faith tradition. Heal. Sorry? Stripes are the wounds. Healed by the wounds of Christ. The lashes. It's the language of Isaiah. So, you know, I mean, after church today, I mean, after the message, we're going to have an opportunity for prayer. I mean, if we believe that we are healed by the wounds of Christ, the stripes of Christ, you know, we might have a bit more initiative to get up out of the pew and come forward, right? Because Jesus can do things. If we make the whole thing mental, just mental, intellectual, we're, we're less moved to do that. Because in our head, it's mostly mental. So there we are, find ourselves in the scene. That's the third. In the morning, while it was still very dark, he got up and went out to a deserted place, and there he prayed. And Simon and his companions, no, Simon, and his companions hunted for him. And when they found them, they said to him, everyone is searching for you. So this unit we looked at not too long ago, so I won't dwell on it. But in the morning, there's the next scene, there's a time sequence, you see, there's a variety of time sequences. In the morning, Jesus is already up. Before the sun rises, he's out, he's found a place, he's praying. Peter eventually gets up and he looks around and people are already gathering at the door saying, where is he, where is he? And then Simon says, I don't know, I better go look for him. And so he does. So Jesus seeks out the place of solitude to pray. What is he doing there? Well, part of it is he's praying for his own peace, I would suggest. He's had a busy night, gathered around. So even Jesus needs a sense of peace, a sense of calm, to be made interiorly well, and then also to seek guidance. What do you want me to do? People are really getting you know, excited about this ministry of, of healing. What should I do? I, I think Jesus is thinking about these things and more going on. To be made calm. Another writer has this in terms of that idea. I like this too. In an action which is meditative and attentive, let's say prayer, he says this, or she, the wrinkles of the soul are smoothed away. And the soul itself spreads unfolds and springs afresh and like the trodden grass of the roadside or the bruised leaf of a plant repairs its injuries becomes new spontaneous true and original prayer as a healing of the soul healing of your wrinkled soul because of all the stuff we go through the soul even gets wrinkled not just the body. And prayer helps smooth it out. And so even for the Son of God, the Son of God seeks a time to be with Abba, our opening hymn talked about giving our attention to Abba, did it not? Abba's praises. So for you and I, where is prayer? Prayer is a way for us to just spend time with God and to recover, right? Recover from all the distress and distraction of life. So there's no wrong way to prayer. Whatever way you're doing it, I'm sure is great. So just pray and continue to give yourself to prayer. That's what we want to do. 
And that will help us. That will heal us. And then finally, we have the fifth scene. Let us go on to the neighboring town so that I may proclaim the message. K. Russo preached the message. For that is what I came out to do. That is why I have come, he says. I have come. I have descended from the Father. I have come, what? To preach. K. Russo proclaim the good news. The kingdom of God is drawing near. That's the good news. The good news, in spite of all the stuff we struggle with and all the financial stress and all the health issues and anxiety with family and everything else, the kingdom of God draws near. And in that, we find our strength. That's our deepest purpose. Ultimately, abundant life with God, abundant life with Christ, not just here and now. There's hope beyond. And we are invited to live in the reality of that hope. That's what proclamation is about. Proclaim. The kingdom of God is drawing near. What, what did that mean for Jesus' listeners? That's what he comes to do. Proclaim the kingdom of God. They still had to wrestle with that. What does that mean, the kingdom of God draws near? They still had to think that through. Do the work. Read the scriptures. Those words don't change their day-to-day -day in every aspect. But the impact of it, the kingdom of God is drawing near. So if you're a fisherman and you go out and you go through a dry season and you hardly get any fish in, eventually the fish will be found. The kingdom of God, just carry on in the hope of that. We struggle with illness. Big shock. Something happens. Life throws these curves at us, right? In an accident. Everything changes. But we have hope in God. Kingdom of God draws near. We need to hang on to that. And that's what Jesus comes to do. Proclaims the good news. You and I have to figure it out. Jesus leads us by his Holy Spirit to keep figuring it out. But that's the hope. That's the word. And he went throughout Galilee proclaiming the message again, K. Russo, in their synagogues and casting out the demons. Continuing to speak the good news. So that's the fifth episode. So it begins in the synagogue. It goes to the domestic house of Simon. And then it carries on on the street. And then the next morning, Peter finds him out in the wilderness praying. And finally, they go on from town to town, now Peter traveling with them. And by the way, it's interesting, in 1 Corinthians, Paul talks about Peter's wife traveling with them. Find that, I believe, 2 Corinthians 5, 1 Corinthians 5, one of those two. Peter's wife traveled with them. So Peter was married, some of them were married, and their families went with them. Maybe not all the time, but some of them. Paul says at one point, hey, am I, am I you know, he didn't have a wife. And he says, hey, you know, I mean, don't think badly of me because I don't that. I'm as good as they are. He carries on and on about it. So they, they're traveling. The families, whatever level. It's more than just men. Disciples following Jesus in the day. So here we are, a day in the life of Jesus. You have 24 hours in front of you. So do I. How do we travel with Jesus in these days, in these moments? And so I think the invitation is we need to be intentional about that. We need to be aware of walking in the presence of Jesus. Amen. It's being in the presence of Jesus. How is Jesus showing up in your life? What does that mean, the presence of Jesus with you? With you here? With you when you go home into your house? Whatever that situation is like? With you when you go to work? with you if you go on vacation, travel, whatever it might be. Jesus with you. That's where we want to go. A day in the life with Jesus. And that's where brothers and sisters in the faith can help us. Because you may not feel, hey man, Jesus, where are you? And maybe a brother or sister in Christ can help you. Can be a source of consolation. When the Christ in you is in weak, Bonhoeffer says, the Christ in the other is strong. When the Christ in them is weak, the Christ in me can be strong. That's his language of saying, Jesus is with us. 
So may we hear, may we walk, may we go out this day recognizing the presence of Jesus. And may we recognize his touch because he will make us well as we look to him. And I say these words in Jesus' name, amen. This is